Welcome to the demo of Age System Design Interviews. I'll start with my introduction. Uh, I'm Vinay. I have around 12 years of experience in building high volume, low latency, scalable applications, uh, enterprise applications like payment gateways, trading applications, and extensively I've been working on Java for around 12 years. Since four or five years, I'm also working on UI designing like using React, Angular, the latest JS tech stack, Node.js, and nowadays I'm exploring Python. I'm a tech enthusiast. I, you know, I try to work, learn new technologies like blockchain and all these things. So I keep on, you know, learning new things and I like giving trainings as well. Uh, so give you the high level agenda of today's demo. So we'll be just starting with one problem and we'll see, you know, if some problem is asked to you in an interview, how the process, you know, how to go about it. So that's what we'll try to capture here in around 45 minutes, one hour. Uh, so let's start with the problem. So let's say you are in a design interview. The interviewer comes to you and asks you, okay, design Facebook. So any idea like how will you start? What will your strategy be? Anyone? Yeah. Point. So we'll start with graphs. Requirements. Yeah. Uh, so M is that? Graphs. Graphs. Yes. Okay. When you mean graph, what exactly you mean? Precision data to be used. Hello, I'm audible. In case there's a connection delay, you can also type as well. Some problem with no, someone is pinging that not over here properly. Is everyone else able to hear me apart from Shinath? Yeah, I think okay. Uh, just ping if you think you're not able to hear us properly. Uh, yeah, anything else? Like, you have been asked, you are sitting actually in a design interview, you have been asked to design face. What do you, you know, how will you start? What else will you do? So, we have come like requirements, graphs. Okay. Yeah. Volume, scale. Anything else you will start with? Okay. We'll talk about cap theorem. Uh, fine. Yeah. So I think. So yes, I think first and foremost important thing as uh, he mentioned, requirements. Even though we know what Facebook is, maybe we are using it on daily basis, still it's good to understand what interviewer is looking for. He might not be looking you to design the entire application because that's not even possible. Like in couple of hours, if you expect that, anyone expects that you will design the complete Facebook application, that's not possible. So it's good to understand what is the requirement. So requirement gathering is one thing. Then scope definition. Like what exactly the minimum viable product the interviewer is looking for? Is he looking for a high level diagram? He's looking for, you know, some particular feature in low level details. So that scope is very important. And then obviously, you know, how much user volume you are expecting. Are there any non-functional requirements, functional requirements? So all those information, unless you have that, you can't succeed in an interview. So you need to understand what interviewer is looking for. And then mostly, most of the interviews will start with the high level architecture diagram and how to design that we'll be covering in more detail how to gather requirements, how to do scope definitions, all these things in detail when we start the actual course and cover the high level system design topic. So now if okay, we have understood the requirements, so there are multiple features in Facebook. Uh, so if we say about features, we have post message, you can just post a message on Facebook, you can view timeline. You go you can see the complete timeline with messages from your friends as well. You can add friends. You can post videos as well. You can do chat. You can create a new account. And there are n number of different features in Facebook available. I mean, so when Facebook started, it was just like a post message view timeline. With time, it has evolved into a lot many things. Adding communities, everything. So obviously, we can't cover all this in an interview or in this class as well. 
So we'll be featuring on focusing on two main features: post message and view timeline. Okay. So now we have decided that we want two features: posting a message and viewing a timeline. So how do you think we can go about it? A very simple solution. Let's forget about the load or number of users, everything. A very simple application. You need to be able to post a message. And when you go to your profile, you should be able to see all the messages posted by you and your friends and everything. So, complete timeline. So, how will you think of a normal, simple design? Yeah. So let's say for now we are not even getting into you know that deep dive that we are talking about APIs. Uh, let's write it down as well. So we are saying we will do like REST API microservice versus monolithic application. Um, and for the people who are not aware of like my, what is microservice, what is monolithic, we'll be covering all that. Um, so we'll discuss it later. Uh, any other thing? Like if you have to, you have been asked to just create a very high level diagram. So this just means some blocks in your application that this is how my application will look like. So any other thing you can think of? store something and retrieve it back. Let's keep it that simple for now. Okay. So let's move to a simple solution. So as you mentioned correctly, we have a web client. So it can be any web application. We at high level diagram, we need not to worry about the technology. It can be a React UI, it can be an Angular UI, it can be a normal HTML page as well. We don't worry about that. <laughs> We're simply saying there is a normal web client, then there's a server. Again, we are not worried about the server is Node.js server, Java server, Python server, some server which will exposing an API which web client can interact with. And then you have a database because obviously if you have messages, you need to store them somewhere. For your college project or with a small application, you can use an in-memory database as well. But if you are looking about an enterprise application, you need a database. So it works. Uh, so let's say basically you were working on this design on your personal laptop. You had a code to do a machine with let's say 3 GB, 4 GB RAM. You started the server, people started texting it. Slowly, the user load increases. Any issues, what will happen? If the load increases, what will you do? Yeah. And how do you decide like, you know, that if there are like, how many requests your server will be able to handle? Like you have a code to do a machine, 4 GB RAM, let's say one terabyte hard disk. How do you decide that? Someone is mentioning yes, our app will be slow. Obviously, because of these reasons, our app will be slow. Any other issues? So let's say now you identified your app is slow because you're running a code to do machine. What will you do? What options do you have? We'll add extra storage. What else we can do? Increase instances. Someone is fine. Any other thing? Try to see any configuration in the server increase the number of requests that you can handle. Yep. Yeah. We can come to caching as well, correct? Yeah, so we can use compression basically when we're sending the response back, maybe we can compress it, send it, 
so that is the network bandwidth time is reduced so another option and someone is mentioning that yes it will be a single point of failure as well your server goes down your application is down so two minute kiss now yeah first option would be you have your machine or your desktop you will improve the resources you will add more ram you have a core to do machine you will try to make it core you will add multiple processors so that's something you can try but there is a limit i mean you can't have like let's say i say that in my desktop in my laptop i have 30 gb of ram that's not possible you will hit a ceiling you cannot be on certain point so single server will not work after a certain extent after a certain time you it will give up then the cost will also be high if you have to really high end servers uh, like a super server sort of thing it will take much more amount of money to get that server so other option as you mentioned we can add more servers so instead of one server you say i have two server three server four servers and coming on to like how do you decide like how many servers you need what ram you need so obviously there are you have to decide on your network bandwidth like you are just storing messages or you are storing videos as well then how many users you are expecting let's say in a minute because every time a new request comes a new thread is spawned you have a limited memory in your application so obviously you have to decide how many threads you can spawn so all these details will cover later in the course but this is a different aspect that we need to think about and this is something that will you know we really be asked in a system design interview so we'll be covering this more detail when we cover the system design in concept section we'll be covering that now we added more servers so any issues when we add more servers so instead of one server now let's say connect two laptops and say okay my both the servers are running in two laptops that we need to do you know session needs to be maintained so why do we need a session in normal web application anyone so we are using http protocol and we are saying we need some session what is the session why we need it every user has this identification sorry uh, we need to identify the every user request uh, we can based on uh, session A session will create for every user Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just write it down as well. So yeah. So session will be for each user, and as someone mentioned in the chat as well, that HTTP is stateless. So basically, what do we do? HTTP is stateless. You make a request, you get a response. Server doesn't remember anything. As per the HTTP protocol, you send a request, you get a response back. There's nothing now. Server is aware of your request. What 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 request request you had given earlier? There's no connection to that. So request one and request two are completely independent. So for that, what you need to do? You need to maintain some state somewhere. So we are saying we'll maintain it in the server, and there we are saying it's called a session. So we can store user information. Let's say you are going to Flipkart. You are buying something. So you added one product, one request in your basket. Some other product got added. Response back. again you make another product to your basket again the session is maintained it is saying that you have one basket with one item another item will be added to that so yeah so now if you add servers obviously session management between two servers like if so so user one first goes to server one second request for the same user goes to server two obviously it needs to know what happened in server one only then server two can respond to that So we need some sort of session management. The other problem is, let's say you are going to Facebook, you are simply typing www.facebook.com. So what is happening behind the scenes? You have a DNS server. DNS is nothing. Basically, it tracks your IP, it uh, tags your IP with a domain name. So Facebook will have some IP. So if you have multiple servers, in future you add more servers. You can't keep track of that. Okay, these servers are again mapped to the same. These IPs are mapped to the same Facebook domain name. So that's why we introduce a load balancer. A load balancer is nothing 
is just one layer between the two servers which takes all the requests and then distribute between load server one and server two you can add more servers as well now here again comes some uh, you know tricky parts like how will the load balancer decide should i send the request to server one or to server two so there are different ways you can decide it based on the load if server one is busy they send it to server two you can do round robin fashion that whenever requests first come send to server one request to again server two and all these things there is a concept called sticky session as well where we are saying if your first request was server by server one subsequent requests will also be served by the same server so we can do it using cookies again we'll discuss it in more detail when we uh, cover the load balancer section in our uh, system design concepts section uh, any questions so far uh, i have one question like uh, yeah uh, we need to host the application in two servers for, for that uh, this this in this concept yeah yeah so basically we are saying we will start two server instances both will have this exact same code base so the same application you are starting in server 1 and server 2 so obviously the advantage is now your load is shared if you had 100 users 50 can go to server 1 50 can go to server 2 that's one advantage other advantage one of your server goes down your application is not down you can still serve all the requests by server 2 and on thank you so servers as well basically nowadays if you move your uh, infrastructure to cloud like amazon elastic cloud it automatically increases the hardware based on the uh, user request so that's all is possible through this architecture okay thank you i understand any other question okay uh moving on so now let's say we have multiple servers and the load is further increasing now in this diagram do you see any other issue so we have multiple servers now we have enough processing power we have enough ram everything is there but still we are seeing some issues in application it is still not very you know performing still i see some latency i go to facebook page i have to wait for 1 minute for my page to load sorry um uh, worker threads okay can you elaborate a little Uh, yeah. So assume in our servers we are spawning multiple threads. With every request, we spawn multiple threads. And when we see that okay, server one has you know is already busy, we move to server two, and we can spawn new servers as well. So processing wise, thread wise, there is no issue in let's say server one, server two there. But still, my application is slow. Yeah. So database is issue. We can have indexing. Ah, uh, any other thing? Okay. Even in RDBMS, you can de-normalize the data and remove joins. That's another option. Ah. Uh, any other issue anyone sees or you know apart from db anything or in db other issues like we can the performance is slow we can have indexes we can remove joins or think about no sql we can uh, remove as many as dependencies sorry uh, dependencies like uh, uh, when we write the code uh, we need to follow the some patterns like a dependency injection uh, it will uh, improve our performance okay so you are saying the code is not optimized you can do the code optimization as well yeah 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 maybe we are not using a, an efficient algorithm <coughs> we can try to write efficient way of storing the data that's one way so let's say the availability is a concern Yep, availability is a concern. You again have a single point of failure there. We added multiple servers, but if database goes down, you are done. Your application is down. Single point of failure is still a problem there. Any other optimization anyone can think of? Let's say if database is an issue, what else can we do? Uh, we'll go for uh, uh, like client side scripting, like Angular JS or anything, uh, any JS. Yeah. It will. Uh, How will that help? Um, most of the uh, 
logic we can write in uh, js files okay but you still need to retrieve at least data from the database yeah yeah right? yeah so if that is slow then even if you perform most of the logic on javascript there can be some issue but yeah obviously yeah, yeah. doing some processing at client side will obviously give performance boost as well yeah. so as someone suggested we can use multiple databases as well yes a good point now then we will not have a single point of failure as well Yeah. Yes, we can do sharding. So basically, that means we can have different data in different databases. So let's go back. So I think yes, all the suggestion that was suggested, uh, those are the options. So. Become bottleneck. Uh, yes, so load balancer can become a bottleneck, but generally what everyone does is they buy a specific hardware for load balancer, and load balancer is doing nothing. It's just taking your request, sending it to server. So load balancer is not doing anything or not adding any delay. So that's why load balancer will have you know less of a bottleneck because it's not doing any processing. Just takes your request out to any server. So if it is very quick, then you don't have a problem. And even load balancer, we don't have like one load balancer. We have like at least two or three multiple classes in active active mode or active passive. We'll be covering it in detail when we cover load balancers in detail in our course. But yes, load balancer, if a single load balancer can be a bottleneck if there are too many requests and we're not able to, or if you try to add logic to your load balancer, which we should not actually. Yeah, so obviously database is a bottleneck here. So what can we do about this? So as I think everyone suggested, we can have multiple databases so this is one form of that topology you can have master and sales. so you have one master every user request the query is executed in master and it's saved there then master replicates it to the slave dvs another advantage there if you have a read heavy application so let's say facebook in initial days less number of people used to write a post most of them used to read even nowadays there are a lot many users who just read your data so in that case you can read from four databases now from master slave one slave two slave three for write, you just have one uh, master database. And if master goes down, any slave can become master. You can automate it in a way that master can become, uh, the slave can become master now. Uh, there are other automation as well. So similarly, if you see that you have more number of writes as well, you can use master master application as well. Other is, as mentioned, database sharding. Basically, it means, let's say based on username, you say <coughs> users A to E will go to database Username starting from S to let's say Z will go to partition two and remaining users will go to partition three. So that way you can distribute your data. So based on the user's name, you can decide that okay, request should go to partition one, partition two, partition three. Or you can say, let's say based on the region that for Hyderabad city, I have a different database cluster. For this city, all the requests will go to this database. For this city, it will go to this database. So based on any way, you can decide that how to distribute that load. So that's called sharding. Database partitioning or sharding. Then obviously SQL, no SQL. So you have to decide like which database you want to use. If you have a structured data with lot many joins, you'll have to use SQL. Their optimization would be indexing and all. But if you have unstructured data and you don't have many joins, let's say you are working on a stock application, you just want to store information about the stock, the complete detail, or in a Facebook, you just want to store a user profile, you can use a no SQL database as well, like MongoDB. Or you can mix like NoSQL and SQL. User profiles, you can use, let's say, NoSQL. For messages, you can use a different DB. So you can mix and match to make sure your database is performant enough. Uh, last is obviously caching. So even with any topology you find, there will be some delay in accessing the database and getting the result back. So we need some sort of caching that will help you that whatever is a frequently accessed data. Let's keep it in a cache. You can use like memcache, redis cache. There are different technologies available that will keep the data for a certain time. But then you need to figure out a way to, you know, cache cannot store everything. You can't replicate your entire database, a huge database in cache. You need to think about cache eviction policies, uh, like last, least frequently used, or sorry, the last frequently used, or based on some other parameters, you decide, that, okay, this much data I'll keep, rest I'll keep on everything. Because obviously there is a cost involved everywhere. You want to keep more data in your cache, you'll have to have more memory that add more costs. 
So it's kind of a trade-off. How you want to deal about it? Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so this was about the high level. So you had the database, how we optimize database, you have servers, we have vertical scaling, horizontal scaling, basically adding more servers or more resources to your server, adding a caching layer. Now let's say the interviewer is happy with your high level design. Now he says, okay, let's get to a low level design. Basically that means the box, that server box that we created was inside that box. What are we doing there? So that's the low level design. For our case, where we were referring to post an API, a message, uh, API to post the messages and an API to retrieve the timeline, so we have to define an API for posting message and we have to define API for retrieving a timeline. So if we have to design a low level API or a low level design for this sort of API, what comes to your mind? What kind of, you know, architecture or system you will have in provide these tools? So now we don't have to think about like high level, we have a web client, we have a server, we have a database, what we are going to do inside the server. So we can have so we can have a test API. Anything else? Even if you are normal, you know, office projects, if you see something like this, you have to provide an API, which will take some data, store it in the database, retrieve it back. So how your application architecture looks like? What do you think, what all we should have? If you think about a layered architecture, what kind of layers you should have in your system? What will track with what? We can define classes. Yes. Again, it's like starts with the database. Sorry? Again, like, uh... Database, API, and uh, yeah, client set. Yep. Uh, API. Yeah. yeah. Client set framework, any client like JavaScript. Or any. Yeah, we need some client framework. Yeah. So basically, if we think of the terms, uh, what all you will need? Obviously, a API. It can be a REST API. Earlier, people used to write SOAP API. Obviously, those are heavy. So, REST APIs, you need to have some classes defined. Then you have database, you have client framework. So, yeah. So, at high level, this is how your design looks like. So, basically, we are saying we have a controller layer. So, this is a layer which exposes the UI APIs. So uh, API, let's say a get API, a uh, post API for posting a message, a uh, get API for retrieving all the timeline. So we'll be covering the REST APIs in detail uh, because it's, you know, in itself it's a, like a big topic. We'll be covering what are REST APIs and how to write REST APIs and how they work. So you have a controller layer which exposes the API. Then you have the service layer, which is your main business logic. So why business logic? Like, let's say you are retrieving timeline of your friend. The business logic would be how many friends you have, for those friends, let's get the all the messages for those friends and then show your timeline. So this is a service layer where you have all the business logic. Then obviously, all this information that you need to fetch will be there in some database. So you need a DAO layer, data access object layer, which will be speaking to your database to get the data. So why we have done this segregation? So the advantage of doing these segregations are obviously, if you, you can always write one class, we will do everything. It will expose the API, it will have your business logic, it will also access your database. Easier to do, but very difficult to maintain. One class, really big class with everything, you have to make any change, you will end up breaking something else and no one can test it. It's just not maintainable. So that's why we divide it into multiple layers. You have a DAO layer, which will, the only work that DAO layer will do is speak to DB. Then you have a service layer, the only thing, uh, get the data from DAO layer and apply some business logic. Controller layer, this is the UI layer, which will take your data, process it in the format that UI can understand. Like if you're writing a REST API, it will just take the data, convert it into JSON, post it back. And then obviously you have a client layer, which will be some JavaScript or HTML layer, which will show this as a presented layer to show to your users. 
and obviously you will add caching as well here because we mentioned that you know we want to optimize our system so we need a caching layer as well so this is how we level design now you have given this high level caching yep. the caching Sorry. is between service layer and do layer or is it between do or tp layer uh, so you can decide so if you are just uh, accessing everything from the DAO layer directly, you can have caching at DAO layer as well. Basically, whatever data you want to fetch, you can directly get from this cache and you can put it as service layer as well. But mostly it's good to have it at DAO layer so that you're not accessing the database directly, you're just accessing the uh, cache at the DAO layer. But if you're adding some business logic to it, is in some application you can have caching at the service layer as well. Then there is transition management as well. So where are your transition boundaries? So if you're storing something in the database, you need to have some transition. So you will have it at the yes. service layer or the DAO layer. So all these things we'll be discussing in the low level design. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, and obviously there will be interaction between different modules. So when you're working the low level design, there are other things uh, that you should know. If you're writing a low level design, you're exposing the APIs, you need to have understand your design principles. Like solid design principles, uh, where we are saying there should be single responsibility in per class. Uh, your object, your code should be open for modification, but uh, open for uh, extension, but closed for modification. Then you have a list of substitution principle. So there are different solid design principles that we'll be covering. So unless you know these principles, you will not be able to write a good code. And when you are in an interview and you are writing a code at a low level API design level, it is expected that you write a good code which is maintainable, testable and follow the <laughs> design principles. Once we understand the design principles, then we'll go to design patterns. It's easy to understand design patterns uh, once you have the understanding of design principles. So obviously it's not design patterns class. So we'll be covering the commonly used design patterns in the applications and in interview. Uh, then comes like class diagrams or sequence diagrams. So you have to show the flow between different APIs. We'll be getting a sequence diagram. So we'll be covering also the diagrams which are asked in interviews. And then obviously we will be having a separate discussion for REST API. So this is what we'll be covering in low level design. Now let's say we have one server, we have one application basically, which is doing everything. You have to view your profile. You will go to that application. You have to post a message in the same application. You have to view someone's timeline in the same application. Any problem you see with that? You have multiple servers, so obviously there is no single point of failure. You have created one application with all the things tied up in one uh, web app, basically. Any issues you see with that? Yeah. So yes, maintainability is an issue. Yes, and then someone mentioned interaction between different services. Uh, but you, if you have basically one application which is serving all the services, you don't need to interact much between different um, services because all the services are part of one app. Anything else? Any other issue you see with that? Maintainability, tech changes. Yes, you need to add a new feature, it becomes difficult because everything is tied up in one module. Yes, testability is a problem. You want to test one feature, it is so much dependent the way you have written the service, it becomes more difficult. Mm, yeah. So, what do we do for that? We divide our system into multiple services. So let's say one service, which is just responsible for taking the data, dump it into database, basically a post message. One service, which is just a read-only service, you want to get your profile, uh, you want to get the timeline, you will have the one service. And maybe for separate for profile level, you can have a separate service. The other advantage you get with these is, the system is more scalable now. So let's say we know that retrieving a message, this is the call that takes, you know, maximum users are using, Get the, uh, getting the data instead of saving the data. So you can scale that service more. You can add more and more hardware to that service and maybe looking at profile, people look at their profile maybe once in a day. So for that, you don't need 
that much hardware. And then, so basically, service by service, you can scale your architecture better. Easy to handle small services. Small service means maybe four or five classes, a very little code is very easy to maintain. In your teams, you can have separate developers responsible for one service. That's also easy to do. Less downtime. Let's say there is some code enhancement you are doing in your view profile service. Other services are still running. There's no downtime. So you just have to get down one service, make your code changes, start it again. Small service, easier to start the server up, and other services are intact. There's no uh, you know, impact on the other services. So you have overall increased the uh, availability of your system. So this is nothing. These smaller services, when we start to write, we call it microservices. So if you write everything in one application, we call it a monolithic application. And when you start breaking it down into different smaller services, we call it microservices. So at high level, this is what microservices is. But obviously, then you need to understand, you know, microservices like how to write them, then how these microservices interact with each other. Let's say you have one microservice for authorization and authentication for security purpose. Now, how that service will interact with other services. All these services need to interact with the database layer. How will you do that? You will not either you can duplicate the code in all services or you can write a separate service that will just speak to the DB. So all these patterns and ways to handle microservices we will be discussing. We have a separate module in our uh, course for microservices. We'll be discussing all that there. What are the advantages in detail? How to make microservices interact with each other and how to write microservices. So we'll be covering that in detail there. Uh, yes, so you can write, you know, one microservice you want to, let's say you think Node.js is best for this sort of application where you have a single event loop instead of you have a multi threading application, a single event loop can work there. Similarly, you can also do like host these different services in different, let's say, clouds. So you think Azure Cloud is good in some basic, you know, um, for some feature is very good. Let's say for image processing, Azure is really good. So you will say, okay, image processing service, I'll deploy in Azure. Then you have a normal, let's say, big data sort of application. Maybe you'll go to Google Cloud and deploy your service there. So that way, you can scale your system. You can utilize the best clouds or best infrastructure for that service. You can even make it, you know, cross-platform, like different platforms for different services. You can always do that. So that is not possible if you write one monolithic application. So that's another advantage of writing a uh, microservice. Uh, any questions so far? Is there any chance to learn uh, to DB design here? Uh, sorry, didn't get that. Uh, is there any chance to design with DB design or like a big application like how they design tables and all things? Is um, there any chance to maybe so we'll not go like uh, in detail, but yes, as part of real world applications, we will be covering that. You know, if you have to design Facebook, how your database should look like, what kind of tables you will have, how they will interact. If you're using a NoSQL DB, how you know the data in your NoSQL database would look like. So we'll be covering that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. So let's take another scenario. So you are trying to create a new user account on Facebook. Another person is also trying to create the account with the same name. What will happen? How will you handle it? Might be a uh, unique uh, ID we will take like phone number, uh, Gmail ID. We'll take. Yeah. No, no, that is fine. Yeah. You have the Gmail ID and everything, but you both are trying to create the same username. So let's say you also want, uh, so let's say being zero straight into the Facebook account, they are saying their username as being zero. There's another person who is also trying to register the name with being zero. Yeah, same time we are saying. Yeah, let's say same time two users simultaneously because let's say Facebook access by thousands of users. Everyone is trying to create their username. There's very much possibility that you and me come up with the same username and we just type it directly there. So what will happen in these sort of conditions? Uh, any request queues you will make? Yeah, it's a race condition. Yes, we can add locking. Yes, we can do first come first serve. And what will happen to the other request? We can use.
use lock yeah lock we already mentioned first come first assign the name but even with first come first serve the problem we are saying is someone simultaneously at the same millisecond someone tries to enter it then what happens yes we can do get and check but again then problem comes you are doing a get both of them did the get username doesn't exist both then try to again create it you know is it about atomicity both did the get at the same time get the result username doesn't exist both is valid both try to save it again issue what we can do is we can create a queue for example there is request randomly we can uh, uh, add a request to the queue so that Maintain a sequential order of yep. the request. And when the first request is done, and then second, for the second request, you can check if it already exists. Then you can get a request. Yep, we can create a queue as well. Uh, but generally, do you see when you write a username, immediately it kind of gives you know this username already exists or it doesn't exist. Uh, the issue with locking, we are talking about multiple servers. So when you have multiple servers, how do you maintain a lock? You can let's say you are using Java, you are using synchronization lock. How to do it? You know, across multiple servers. So Multi-threading programming or these sort of synchronization thing are not that simple. It used to be simple when you had a simple server, when you know you just add synchronization, you are done. You don't have much data load. You can make it serial. But when we are talking about a distributed system where there are multiple servers, multiple users coming at the same time, it's very difficult to do a normal locking. So obviously synchronization is one way, but how to do it across servers? Uh, there is one thing called optimistic locking. Uh, so there's a concept like passive locking, optimistic locking, where when you're saving something, you just try to check what is existing there, and you update it based on the old value. So let's say in currently in you know, a system we have value one, you want to update it to two. So you will see that okay, I'll update it to only if the value is still one. If someone has already changed it to two, you'll not be able to change it. So that's what optimistic locking. We'll be covering it in more detail uh, in again system design overview section. Uh, so and then in the so we have a separate section where we want to deal with all the distributed systems and this multi-threading sort of problems. This is a very simple problem. You can see this problem anywhere. You are going to book a movie ticket or a flight ticket. In Book My Show, you can see it. If you are booking a ticket, there are three seats available. I also want those three seats. Someone else also wants those three seats. How to handle it? We want at least one user to get those seats, and still, you know, it should not be a double book. That both of them are able to book the same seat. So these sort of Issues come when we are talking about distributed system and more complex. So you have a separate section. We'll be covering this in more detail. Yep. So yeah, that's about today. So any questions so far? Any questions about the course? Any question about the demo or anything you want to know?